Deanna can take it away. <laughs> all right. Well, welcome everyone. And just to, to clarify, if you all can mute, mute, mute yourselves, um, even mm -hmm. if you're off camera, can you mute yourselves? Just because, especially if you're cooking and there's background noise and all that, but no, interrupt me in the middle of talking because I normally don't take a breath. So it's fine to interrupt me mid-sentence. I'd rather you ask the question while I'm preparing or doing it because most likely other people have that question or please, this is what I love about these cooking um, demos, comments. Like if there's something you do that's a little unique or different or um, you can add um, to what we're doing or a technique you like with it or a spice you like with it, please let us know. I absolutely learn every single time I'm doing these cooking demos from you, the audience. So that's what I love about it. So um, it's a continual learning curve for everyone. And most likely what you're going to share is going to be like an aha for someone else as well. So, um, and then, or if you want, you're welcome. You don't, if you don't want to be on camera or whatnot, um, I mean, you can certainly just do an audio. You can put your question in the chat and Beth will be monitoring that. Mm -hmm. So she can interrupt me and ask the question too. Um, so again, I'm Deanna Seagrave Daly. I'm a registered dietitian. Um, a blogger at teaspoonofspice.com, a mom, and I own Teaspoon of Spice with my co-author of our cookbooks um, with my partner, Serena Ball, and our tagline is two dietitians love food as much as you do. So we love teaching about nutrition and diet through food and cooking and the taste of food. Often I'll be like, oh yeah, I have to remind you what the nutrients are in this because I'm so wrapped up in how to prepare it, how to make it taste better. Um, we're very big on if you think something's healthy and you're eating it just because you're like, oh, well, it's good for me, but you're like, eh, with the taste, put it down. There's another way to cook it that might taste better. Or, you know, you don't have to love every vegetable or love mm -hmm. every fruit. It's okay. I don't love cauliflower. That's my dietitian confession or green smoothies, but we'll leave that for another time. But that's okay if you do. So we, um, we want you to be able to enjoy food because as we know, we hear diet in this culture and it's can be restricting, it can be frustrating, all of that. So speaking of, the Mediterranean diet is something I'm sure you've heard a lot of, and for good reason. Um, it has been like a diet lifestyle that's been studied since the 50s. There's lots and lots of research behind it, first starting with connections with better heart health in people who lived in those countries. And since then, there's been more studies expanding all different types of disease states, how it is beneficial to eat this way to help you um, with prevent or help you even if if you are in the midst of some of those disease states. Um, the US News and World Report ranks the top diets um, every year. And for the fifth year in a row, the Mediterranean diet is the number one diet overall, which is very good to hear because I have a third mm -hmm. Mediterranean cookbook coming out at the end of the year <laughs> called Sustainable Mediterranean, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. But it is also was ranked as the top for easiest to follow. Um, the top, I'm gonna make sure all the categories, a lot of things, top health, heart health diet. It was tied with um, uh, another diet as well, top for healthy eating and top to follow if you have diabetes as well. So for many reasons, um, but, the, uh, I just want to talk about it real briefly. Like a lot of times when you hear Mediterranean, we think, we think the foods of Italy, we think the foods of Greece, France, Spain, that is what's portrayed in the media. If you're going to Google that, those are the photos you're going to find. That might be the cuisines you're most familiar with, because maybe you have ancestors from those areas that came over. But there's 21 countries that surround the Mediterranean Sea. And in the Mediterranean diet includes all those cultures and all those foods and spices. So I wanna bring some awareness to that. So for the first giveaway, um, the first person you can tell me either in the chat or you can unmute yourself and shout it out, a country that borders the Mediterranean Sea that's considered part of the Mediterranean diet that is not Italy, Greece, France, or Spain. So um, if anyone wants to venture a guess, no demerits for not getting it right. <laughs> Israel, no. Kristen Falk, you win. You win the prize. Yay, Kristen. Kristen Thank you. Yes, yep, Israel she's got one of them. Excellent. So I think she's going to win our, my, uh, my first cookbook, the 30-minute mm -hmm. Mediterranean diet cookbook, and some mm -hmm. really cool beef swag as well. Um, that's so right. That will follow up with you, get your information after that. So yes, Israel. Sometimes people forget the Middle East part of the Mediterranean um, country. So that's Lebanon, that's Israel. Um, yay, Kristen. <laughs> Syria is part of that too, up into Turkey. And then you can kind of get up. I want you guys all, when you're off this, go look a map of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and then it kind of goes up um, from Turkey 
into some parts that are considered Asia or Eastern Asia or actually Eastern Europe too. So countries like Albania, um, the former Yugoslavia, if you're old enough like me to remember when it was Yugoslavia and it's now Bosnia, Herzegovina, um, Montenegro is another um, country too, the island of Cyprus as well. So Slovenia, Croatia, um, and then you kind of get into Italy and that area too, the island of Malta is it considered as well a country. And then I think a lot of times people don't realize or might forget about the North African countries. So the Northern continent of Africa has a huge border along the Mediterranean seas. And those include the countries of Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, Morocco and Algeria. So hmm. they bring in very important and amazing awesome spices and foods to the culture as well. So that was just like a little geography um, education lesson too, but it's it's great way to um, think about everything. But a common theme through all those countries, which I sometimes think might not be portrayed as much too, is meat. Meat traditionally has been a part of these cultures and beef especially too, prepared in many different ways um, with different spices, um, which is really cool about um, beef in particular is it is a fabulous vehicle and flavor enhancer to a meal and to pair with foods that sometimes you might not get as much of like vegetables or grains, even fruit. That might mm -hmm. sound strange, but I'm going to talk about that. Um, and that's very traditional in these cultures too. So that's what's fabulous about um, beef. It is a part of these cultures. It is a part of the balanced Mediterranean diet too, because we're including all those other foods all in the dish as well. And that's what we're going to showcase today too. Um, so that's one thing to think about. And it's such a great compliment because the nutrients you're going to get from beef. So in general, a three ounce serving of beef is around 170 calories, depending on the cut. Um, but it is uh, provides 10 essential nutrients. So an amazing source of high quality protein, zinc, iron, which are you know food uh, nutrients we often need that we don't get enough of, mm -hmm. as well as other nutrients. And those comp that beef complements the vegetables, the grains, the fruits that provide different nutrients. So together you have that more complete meal. Okay, so that's my little spiel about the Mediterranean <laughs> diet, including some beef in it too. And what we're going to talk about tonight is ground beef, and we're using lean beef. So the American Heart Association has um, has pinpoint thirty six types of beef that are considered lean. So that's fabulous. There's lots to choose from. And one trick you can use when you go to the store, if you're like, ah, this is confusing, I don't know, is look for the word loin or look for the word round. So something like a tenderloin, sirloin, or round roast. Those are considered leaner cuts um, of uh, beef. And some of the um, most affordable ones that are lean, I have a list here, and I'm sure Beth can share that with you too, are bone boneless top sirloin loin to look for, ground mm -hmm. round, top round steak, top round roast. So again, we're using the round here, the eye of round steak, I have round roast, and what we're going to be using tonight, 90% and higher lean ground beef. So when you go to the store, you might see 85, 90%, 92, 93, 96. So shoot mm -hmm. for like 90% or higher is going to give you that leaner um, source of ground beef that the American Heart Association um, likes to talk about. Okay, so let's get started now. We are going to, and I don't know if anyone's cooking along, if anyone wants to say in the chat, if they're cooking along, if you're not, that is fine. You can be sitting back open, maybe having a glass of wine or a beverage as we cook along. <laughs> um, but the first thing we're gonna do, if you are cooking along, we're gonna preheat our oven to 400 degrees, okay? Um, which I did ahead of time, so I wouldn't get flustered because I have a new oven and sometimes I don't turn it on right. And I'm like, ah, okay, it's on. <laughs> so we're gonna be making these beef and bulgur koftas. So this is actually a, a variation of the recipe in our second book, the Easy Everyday Mediterranean Cookbook. And actually, this is my business partner did this. Um, here's our lovely picture. We had a gorgeous mm -hmm. photographer. I did not take this picture um, for this. <laughs> um, and this is our beef and quinoa koftas. Now, if you know anything about quinoa, you might be like, wait a minute, that's not from the Mediterranean. And you're right, it's from South America. The one thing we like to do when we talk about the Mediterranean diet is talk about ways to make it accessible. Um, so often, like if there's an ingredient that's kind of hard to find or it's typical to the Mediterranean, we might say, we'll try this instead that you might have access to. And as we know over the years, quinoa is like everywhere now. So that is something you could swap in, but I'm using bulgur tonight. That's a little, that's way more traditional 
traditional for the Middle Eastern version of these dishes called kofta, which I'm going to explain what it is in a minute. But certainly you could also use couscous, which is, so bulgur's a cracked wheat. It's parboiled, dried, and that it's, it's parboiled, dried, and then cracked. Um, so it cooks pretty fast in about 10 to 12 minutes. It looks like, I'll show you in a minute, it looks like couscous almost. Um, couscous picks up even faster. You boil water, throw it in five minutes, it's ready. You could use that in this dish too, but you could also use quinoa. So here's an example of how beef is being paired with grains and the whole grains. And the whole grains are gonna provide different nutrients than the beef is, but together it's gonna to give you that much more, be a more nutrient dense meal um, and taste delicious too. So koftas are basically any type of like meatball or mini meatloaf dish that's very um, traditional in the Middle Eastern Mediterranean seas. It's also traditional in South, Asia, in the Balkans area, Central Asia, a lot of these countries have their own version of this. And um, it comes from the Persian word that means pounded meat. So very traditional in Lebanon, especially. Some people say that's where it's really originated from, but all countries have their own variations of it. Some countries just, it's ground beef and maybe some onions and parsley. Here, we're gonna do some spices with it, um, with the bulgur. Okay, so I will stop yapping and we're gonna get going. Um, the one thing to start we can do right now is get a muffin tin out. And this is how we're making it. Um, let's see, Kara. So I can substitute, what did she say there? I can't read the whole thing. She says, um, does that mean I can substitute quinoa for couscous and other recipes? Yes, for the most part you can, Kara. And that's a great question because if you are gluten-free, bulgur couscous that is a wheat based thing and that's also another um, thing about quinoa quinoa is actually a grass so mm -hmm. yes in most cases it really i can't think of an example care when you couldn't um do that um sometimes if you're using a baked good it might act a little differently but for mm -hmm. in most cases you really can which is which is fantastic so um it's a fantastic uh, way to if you can't eat wheat so great question okay so i'm mm -hmm. taking a muffin tin here and i'm just coating it a 12 cup muffin tray because that's how we're going to easily portion out our koftas. And koftas are shaped in meatball shapes. Sometimes they're shaped in cylinders, um, sometimes oval. Sometimes they're actually skewered on a kebab type thing. They can be grilled, fried, um, you know, baked, roasted. I feel like that scene from, uh, <laughs> from uh, 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 what's the, um, Forrest Gump, I can't even talk. Yes, I'm yes, all the way to shrimp, the right? <laughs> yeah. So, that's how common it is. Um, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna use this to portion it out really easily. It's just basically like you know, like a Middle Eastern, almost Lebanese way, or different countries in that area to make way to make meatballs. To kind of think of meatballs a little differently, instead of just putting those breadcrumbs in, we're gonna put some bulgur in. So we're gonna get the bulgur cooking. So I just have a small pot here, and I already put in two thirds cup of water in my pot, and then I'm gonna put the bulgur in, which I measured out earlier. And let's see. Oh, here it is. One third cup. So it's kind of like double the liquid. Um, you could use beef broth in this if you want to flavor it. I'm just using water. Um, I've done it with orange juice too to give a little flavor too. So it's just these little grains. It looks a little bit like couscous, but a little darker because um, it is a whole grain. Sometimes couscous, you can get whole wheat couscous. Regular couscous doesn't have that brand, but this does. So um, this bulgur has been thought, has been around since like biblical times. Like that's, it is literally, remember when the word ancient grains was popular years ago? It is an ancient grain for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's delicious. If you ever get tabbouleh, that's what's in tabbouleh, bulgur. It's bulgur and parsley. Um, and talk about- Diana, that's typically- land. Yeah. It's typically in like the rice aisle, correct? Like someone yeah. would find it in the, well, rice, the rice, maybe in like yes. a specialty grain you section. You know, I'm glad you asked that because sometimes it's harder to find than others. I often mm -hmm. find it, yes, either in the rice aisle. Um, I, I'm wondering, I don't know if I've ever found an international ally, but I absolutely find it actually in like the natural foods aisle mm -hmm. where often they have like spelt and teff and maybe some other grains too. Um, if your store does bulk grains, that's mm -hmm. where you can find it as well. So that's a great question. Um, mm -hmm. You can also order it online too. Okay, so I just threw it right in. I'm gonna bring it to a boil. Um, and then we're gonna reduce the heat, cover it and cook it for about 12 minutes, okay? So I'm gonna do that over on my stove because I'm gonna use my other little burner here. So that's gonna come to a boil really quick because it's only two thirds cup of water. I'm actually gonna cover it 
because that's going to help bring it to a boil faster and save a little energy. So I got to make sure I look over, over it so it doesn't boil over. Okay, so that's our bulgur we got going. You can make mm -hmm. this recipe with leftover bulgur, leftover couscous, leftover quinoa. Even if it's flavored with something, it's a great way to use the leftover grains you might have in your fridge. You could even do it, this is going to be crazy, oatmeal. You could do it with oatmeal. You really could. Another way to get a grain in. Okay. So while that is cooking, we are going to just um, cook up some onions because onion just adds fabulous flavor. It's in so many things and onions and garlic in so many dishes in the Mediterranean. And I want to show you really quickly a good way to cut an onion. Now, this onion is very squat and flat. So this might not be the best example to use, but this is a Vidalia onion, which is sweet onion. Um, but this can help prevent the crying in the kitchen <laughs> and help like your oven onion be a little more even. Okay, so um, you can peel off the outer layer, but don't worry about getting all the skin off um, at first. And by the way, after we, Serena and I have the Sustainable Mediterranean Cookbook coming out in December, we have so many tips on reducing food waste, upcycling, and recycling food. Save this. You might think, what the heck can I do with this? Put, get a freezer bag. I want you to put your scraps, your carrot stripes, your vegetable peels, your onion skins are fabulous flavor enhancers. And you can make your own like veggie broth or beef broth or chicken broth with that. Once you have a bag full of scraps of anything, ends of celery, ends of like any onions that you're cutting, I mean, not onions, um, like green onions, that kind of thing. Just throw it in a pot, cover it with water, put some like basil in there. Uh, I mean, not basil, bay leaf, maybe some peppercorns um, and just boil it and just let it simmer down and you have your own like vegetable broth from those scraps too. Otherwise, um, hopefully you can com compost them. Okay, so what I do is just literally cut it down the middle here. Like I said, this is a big squat onion, so <laughs> might be a little harder to do this. And this is the um, stem here, okay? And that's what we want to keep intact, all right? Um, and then what we're going to do is, um, if you, now you should be able to, actually this is when I peel off the outer layer here. All right. Okay, but see, I'm keeping, I'm sorry, not the stem, the root. I'm sorry, we're keeping the root intact, okay? Because once we cut through that, that is when we start crying, all right? So mm -hmm. I just like to go down the side here because we want this pretty fine. We're just cooking this onion up really quickly. Um, so we want it pretty fine because this is going to go into like our meatballs. So you, you don't necessarily want big old honking pieces of onion. So I'm kind of going through, I don't know if you can see here, down the side like this, but I'm not cutting all the way till that piece came off, but I'm keeping this root here intact. Because once you cut through that, that's when the frying starts. So I'm cutting off the end of the stem there. That's gonna go on my pile of scraps. And then I'm just gonna cut through here. And then at, at the very last minute, well, some of it's already coming apart. So like I said, it's easier with a, less of a squat onion is, see, I haven't even cut through the root at all. I kept up intact the entire time. So that's just one way to kind of cut down on the crying. Otherwise you're gonna have to use, I have been known to put my daughter's swim goggles on if I have to cut a lot of onions. <laughs> that's the only thing that I found that worked for. I know I don't wear contacts, but apparently people tell me wear contacts, that really helps. Okay. I was gonna so say, yeah, contacts wear are here. And when I chop uh, onions without them in, I definitely notice a whole new yeah. sensitivity and crying factor. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so half of an onion is about, it depends on how big your onion is, it's about a cup. So we're gonna use half of that, but I already have half of this I can cook up. Um, you know what, I might need to cook it up and use it in something else. All right, so let me get my little frying pan here. We're just gonna cook this up for like five minutes. And that's just so we don't have raw onions going into like our meatball mix. So I'm gonna use, of course, olive oil because there's so much heart health benefit. That's the common theme throughout Mediterranean cuisine, the fat. Of, that's used the most is olive oil, okay? Plus it adds phenomenal flavor to everything. So I'm doing about two teaspoons, that's plenty. But it's gonna not only cook up the onions, it's gonna add some flavor to um, our koftas as well. Okay, so once that starts going, I'm gonna heat, I'm gonna cook that up. Oh, meanwhile, I was not paying attention to this, my boulder, which is already cooked down. <laughs> it already boiled and cooked down. So I'm gonna just time that, let's see, hold on here. Clear time. So what I didn't tell you was if you already, your bulgur was already boiling, it's about two, 12 minutes or until like the water is gonna really evaporate. So I'm gonna really turn this down because I don't wanna burn the pot. Here. 
but that really, um, I didn't pay attention to that. So that cooked up really quick. Okay. Um, all right. So we got your onions going. And as soon as my uh, skillet heats up, once you feel like the heat going, you don't, you want, you don't want to put it in the cold oil. You just want it to heat a, just be a little bit warm. It depends on your stove. I found my gas stove heats up a lot quicker than like an electric burner too. So it just depends, but you're just going to like, we're going to cook down the onions for about five minutes. Okay. And then that's done as far as really the hardest part of prepping this, everything else is like made, making the meatballs and mixing them together. Okay. So once um the the bulgur is done we're going to put in here once the onions are done we're going to put in here but in the meantime we're going to put all our other spices in and this is when it gets fun and kind of gives it more oops, like it just flowed right out there good catch <laughs> more of our um kind of middle eastern um spice uh spice um profile okay so we're going to put in this is i'm putting some garlic powder in um, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just cook up the garlic in here, but if you don't want to bother, you can use garlic powder instead. So I'm actually using um, a half a teaspoon of garlic powder, and I was going to measure this all out ahead of time, and I forgot, so you're going to see me do it in real time. Okay, so we're using a half a teaspoon of garlic powder. Um, so if you want to use, uh, is someone talking? Oh, let's see, am I hearing my cell phone? You're actually, it was okay on our side. Okay, I thought I was hearing an echo. Okay, good, can you hear me? Yep, perfect, yep, nothing's changed. Okay, I thought I got muted, okay, perfect. Okay, so ha uh, one half a teaspoon of garlic powder, and then um, if you uh, wanted to use regular garlic, you could uh, chop up a clove and put it in here. You know what, it's funny, I never use this pan on here, and it flies, that's why. I'm like, ooh, this is a new pan. It's sliding right off of my uh, thing here. Okay, I think someone's not on mute because I'm hearing some background. So just make sure everyone, if you guys are all mute, um, unless you're talking, I think that's why I was hearing the echo. Okay, so remember, this is about a cup. So I'm only going to use about a half, I use a half a cup here. And then I'm just going to cook this down. Beth, can you time me and just tell me like for about four minutes when four minutes are up? Absolutely. Yep. Perfect. All right. So we're just going to keep an eye on that and keep going. All right. So we have our half a teaspoon of garlic powder, and then I'm going to put a fourth of a teaspoon of salt in. Serena and I, in most of our, uh, I eyeball it, um, but you can certainly use a measuring thing. Serena and I, um, in our cookbooks, pretty much always call for kosher salt or sea salt. And that's simply because we like the texture you can get a little more bang for your buck. The gran granules are a little bigger, so it's a little less sodium than using iodized salt. But if iodized salt is all you have, that is fine. You can certainly use that. Um, or any kind of you know, other salt, that is fine. Um, here's my spiel about salt that I want. I do every time I cook. <laughs> and it is, you need to add salt to your cooking. The sodium in our diet in America, and when you hear we get too much sodium in our diets as Americans, and that is true, does not come from the salt you're adding to cooking, unless you are dumping a ton in, um, or you're doing it really like restaurant style, or even honestly, the salt you might add to your dish at the table. So when they say, put the salt shaker down, it's like, you need some salt to make food taste good. Um, there's four key elements to recipes. I don't know if you've heard of the cookbook. It's also a series on Netflix. I think it's salt, um, acid, fat, um, heat. I always get the combination wrong. But those are four elements that have to be in every recipe for it to taste great. And heat provides flavor. When we're like, we're kind of like frying and sauteing up an onion, that's going to add flavor. If you roast something or you grill something, think about the flavor that adds. So heat adds flavor. Fat adds flavor. You need a little fat, that fabulous fat from our beef that gives such an incredible flavor is why we love it. And the flavor from olive oil and fat, you need that. Acid is something that adds sparkle to your dish. It wakes it up. If you have a final dish like soup or even one of this things and it just tastes flat, you can add some acid. So that's in tomatoes. So that's why like a lot of tomato dishes just, they just taste great. Italian dishes taste great. You can add a little vinegar. Um, so something like a soup if it just tastes flat or that's why often you see when you're ordering something, it comes with a lemon slice or a lemon, lime slice. You squeeze it over, it's citrus, it adds some sparkle. And salt's the other thing. You need a little salt in your cooking. Okay, so. Uh, you're about three minutes there on the timer, okay, Deanna. 
Well, my boulder is absolutely done. It's like probably stick into the pot here, but that is done. Um, sometimes if you add a little too much water, it's okay, it might cook, but then you would just want to um, uh, drain it a little, but I'm just gonna make sure so it doesn't stick. I'm just kind of like fluffing it right now, okay? And then we're gonna add it to our, um, our mixture in a minute. Okay, perfect. And my onions, I can tell they're almost done. I'm about to, this is really hot, really fast. Okay, so don't be afraid to add salt because the majority of sodium in our diet does not come from that. It comes from foods like lots of frozen meals. And I'm not saying you can't eat those here and there. That is fine. A frozen pizza with salad sometimes is, it's dinner, it's fine. It's just if that's all you're eating, like lots of frozen foods, even canned foods too, which is fine. We can rinse those beans and take some of the sodium out. But it's a lot of fast food, like, you know, restaurant food. Um, and again, we all can eat that. It's fine. But just you cook a little more often, you have a little more control in how much you're adding. But please don't not add anything because it's just not going to taste good. So, okay, that's my salt, salt, salt spiel. I do it every time I do a cooking demo just because um, salt, you need some in cooking. Just like anything, a little goes a long way. Okay, so I think my onions are done. I'm just going to take them off here. I'm gonna put them over here for now. Okay, let's finish our um, our mixture here. All right, see how are we doing on time here? All right, we're good. Yep, you're right? good to go. You're definitely at that okay, four minute mark. Um, yep. Okay, so we got our garlic powder. I keep repeating that. We put our salt in, and now we're gonna put some cinnamon in. So this might be a new thing for you to add to your ground beef. Is cinnamon? It is very common. <clears throat> North African dishes, Middle Eastern dishes, to do and use a lot of those spices that we typically only put with sweet foods and desserts. So things like cinnamon, um, cardamom, which you may have heard of that too, allspice. Um, they're in a lot of savory dishes and especially beef dishes. So it just gives this amazing flavor. Trust me, it's, it's delicious. So we are putting our cinnamon in, in here. So one fourth teaspoon of cinnamon along with one fourth teaspoon of cumin. So again, that's not always a combination you might think of. Um, cumin's in a lot of like Tex-Mex, Mexican dishes, but also in Mediterranean too. I saw a question pop up. Yeah, it's actually, it's a comment from um, our friend Denise here. She says she actually puts, I'm guessing, I don't know if this is cumin or cinnamon, but um, in her fried chicken too. So maybe it's the, oh. the cinnamon. So that's a different kind of uh, uh -huh. ingredient there too. I love it. And her fried chicken. Oh, that sounds amazing. I love it. It's probably like one of those things like you just can't put your finger on it when you're eating it. It's like, what is that, that amazing exactly. flavor in there? <laughs> and it's, if it's not something you grew up doing, it might not be something that you think of. But then once you have it, you're like, well, heck, that's that's amazing. So yes. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a warming spice. So it just pairs fabulously with like your chicken and your beef in this, mm -hmm. this situation too. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we put the cumin into, I just put one fourth teaspoon of black pepper. And then just for a little hit, I'm going to do some crushed red pepper. I'm going to do one fourth teaspoon. That's going to add a little kick. Um, you can use less um, if you want. You could use cayenne pepper too. Um, I would only do one eighth if I was going to do that. So we're getting kind of like that sweet, sweet warming from the cumin and smoke, I mean, from the cinnamon um, warming and smoky from the cumin. And we're getting that hit of heat from our uh, crushed red pepper. This is a fabulous combination for just, I mean, you could put this in and make hamburgers out of this too, which would be mm -hmm. amazing. We're doing meatballs here. Um, but you could use the spice mix for so many combinations, even in vegetables, like roasted vegetables as well. So um, the sky is the limit with all of that. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's put in our onions. Okay, actually, I'm gonna mix this up just a little bit. I'm like making sure I have my thing down. Okay, cool, you can see me here. Already, it smells so good. What I will do sometimes is like, triple this or quadruple it and put in like a little spice jar. And then you can just like, again, mix it into like, if you have some green beans, mix it into that mm -hmm. while you're cooking it or after you cook it or broccoli, um, carrots. Mm -hmm. um, it's so many different, it's just like a different kind of spice mix to use also with vegetables too. Mm -hmm. All right, so we got our onions and then we're gonna add in our bulgur. And actually I'm gonna get a spoon to pull this out more. And again, this is when if you have leftover any kind of grain, like um, couscous, quinoa, 
Like I said, oatmeal, steel cut oatmeal. That would work with this. All right. Because I was not paying attention, so I'm just sticking to the bottom here. But that's my fault for letting it boil over. But okay, there we go. And again, I want you to think of adding grains like this, almost like if you're used to making meatballs and you have breadcrumbs. It's kind of that same thing. It's giving a binder, but it's adding such great nutrients um, to this dish to complement our beef. Okay, so we got that in. And then we're gonna put in our ground beef, which I just took out. Oh, here it is. Okay. So this is a pound of lean ground beef. Um, in this recipe, what do we call for? We call for at least 90%. This is 92%, I believe, that I got. Um, so it's our lean ground beef. We're gonna put that in. And then we're gonna also put in one egg because that's gonna help bind everything. And I did take my egg out. Let me see if I can find it. Here it is, found it. All right, so one egg goes in. All right, and then I have a compost post bowl here that I put everything in and we dump it in our compost. My husband and I are not like um, gardeners as far as, well, he has a better greener thumb than I do, but we just have this big, huge in the backyard compost thing that there's vines that grow around and stuff. It just looks like a big bush at this point, but that's where I, we have put like our food waste scraps from, from vegetables and um, eggs, shells, like uh, shrimp shells, all that for like many, many years. And it's kept it out of like landfills or we don't have to go through the garbage disposal. So if you can compost that stuff, that's great. Helps reduce food waste for sure. Okay, so now we get to get our hands. I like using my hands. If you ever made meatballs, that's what we're doing. We're made a meatloaf here. If, if you don't really love doing this, you certainly could use a um, spoon and then a scoop. But I just feel like I get a much better feel for when I'm mixing this together. And let me tell you, if any of you guys are making this right now, the smell of the spices is so good. <laughs> just that aroma, that cinnamon. Oh my gosh, with the cumin. It's just some, it's like a magical combination in my personal opinion, so. Okay, so at this point, we are going to put them in our muffin cups. So Mr. Indiana, we have a quick question here too. Yes. Um, so if we substitute a pre-cooked grain, how much would they use? So you're using one cup, one third cup of the dry, like uncooked bulgur. Yes, or... I would have to look that up. I think it is about, I will get back to you. Um, if you, if you Google like how much one third cup of bulgur is, and I, grains are all different off the top of my head. I don't think it's quite a cup. I'd say it's probably like three fourths to a cup kind of thing. So that's a great question. Cause I was just thinking that I need to know that for my next, uh, with bulgur specifically. Um, but normally like it, it's at least double, if not, um, triple with grains. So it's probably to be safe. It's probably about, I would say three fourths of a cup. That's a great question though because it's a great way to prevent food waste and use up um, what you have in the fridge and on hand. Okay, we're gonna divide this into 12. So do it any way you want. I kind of do it in like eyeball it, do it in half. And then I'm gonna take my half and do each one half again. Just simple math, right? <laughs> and then each of these will be three portions. And here's the fun thing, you can shape them any way you want. You can make them meatballs, you can make them a little bit more like a, um, more like a uh, kind of like this, like a cylinder, if it's gonna fit in your muffin tin. Um, but yes, that's the way you can do it. All right, so wait here. This is my this is my half. Okay, so I'm doing three with these. Getting distracted here. Okay, you guys can see how I'm doing this. It doesn't have to be neat. It doesn't have to be beautiful or pretty. Um, so each portion is gonna be three here. All right, I think I overdid it on this one. So I'm gonna just eyeball it. And the thing is with ground beef, the less you're like manhandling it, the better it's going to taste. It's just going to be a little more moisture, moist and uh, delicious. So we don't want to like pound these into oblivion, right? <laughs> even, though, even though the uh, kofta is known, it's the uh, Persian, um, taken from the Persian word for pounded meat. We really don't want to pound this together. We want to treat our ground beef very delicately, but all right. So that is looking good. Okay, that's good. Now I'm going to just wash my hands. And then we're going to put this in the oven. And actually, as, as Deanna's washing her hands up there, uh, we want to do another giveaway opportunity here. So those of you that have been listening and heard Deanna talk about different tips for finding a lean cut of beef in a supermarket, do you remember one of those two key words that she used? Um, so we talked about the 90% for ground beef with some of those cuts. Wow, Erica, man, good draw. You got it. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's one. 
So Erica, yes, the answer and Donna too, you both got it right. Erica was quick there. She got a loin. So again, loin and round are two of those really easy keywords um, that you can use to identify lean cut in the supermarket. You guys, job. Yeah, I'll send you, I have to wash my hands in just a moment okay. and then I'll send you a quick message to grab your uh, mailing address. Awesome. Way to go guys for listening. All right. So we're going to bake this in 400 degree oven for about 16 to 18 minutes. This is when a meat thermometer is key because you always just can't tell by looking at it. So you want to make sure it gets to 160 degrees Fahrenheit and then we know it's ready. So, or the, that they are ready. So I'm going to put the timer on here for 16. And I'm going to get my meat. That is one thing I did not get out. Okay. A very crucial tool to have in your kitchen when you're cooking beef or chicken or fish, all of that. Okay, so now um, with our koftas, um, I will show you in a little bit, but it's um, really fun. You can serve them all different ways. Um, you could just serve them just on a bed of greens. You could serve them with, this is what we suggest in our recipe, and I added a little something to besides the recipe. I'm traditionally often served with pita, like you could put it in the pita pocket like a sandwich or put it on top and then put, um, serve it with some cucumbers, tomatoes. I mean, you could just uh, like chop everything up and mix it together. It's also, those are delicious. Like if you guys have seen those grain bowls are so popular nowadays where you could have a another type of grain, or maybe you have extra bulgur in a, in a grain dish with chopped up veggies, maybe even like some pickled something that's very popular in the Middle East or like pickled salads types of things um, with other chopped up veggies. And then you have your kofta in there too as the protein source as well. So one other thing um, is savory yo uh, is yogurt. So like the Greek yogurt that we know very well, every culture has a version of this in the Mediterranean. Uh, labna is one version often in like Lebanon. It's, it's called, it's basically strained milk. Um, and sometimes it's called cheese even, but it's basically like what you think of as Greek yogurt. Because Greek yogurt is like our regular thought of yogurt that's strained and there's less whey in it. So more protein. Um, and it's delicious and served like with everything. I even have a recipe in my book where you serve shrimp on it and it sounds crazy, but it's phenomenal. So what I like to do is take Greek yogurt and just pour in some olive oil. So um, a good ratio is a half a cup of plain Greek yogurt. It doesn't matter the percentage. I like to go 2%, like kind of in the middle. Um, and then doing two tablespoons of olive oil to about a half a cup. And then maybe a little salt, maybe a little pepper, maybe a little za'atar, which is a fabulous spice. I encourage you all to um, put into your, um, spice, uh, your, uh, your spice drawer, which is a mixture mainly of sesame, um, thyme, and something called sumac, which is very popular in Middle Eastern countries. It's like a, a citrusy kind of blend. It's amazing on everything, everything. Um, it's used on pita bread. It's used with beef. It's used with in vegetables. So that's delicious. Or you could just do a little salt and pepper too. So that could be a spread. That could be a dip. You could even, this is what I do. This is kind of my more American version of it is take um, like everything bagel seasoning. I know that's really popular now. So like with, has garlic, sesame seeds. Um, that's a common thing with the uh, za'atar, um, poppy, uh, not poppy seeds, sesame seeds. Um, yeah, poppy seeds too. Roasted garlic, salt, pepper kind of thing. And mix that together. And now you have a savory dip. So sometimes I think we only think of yogurt as sweet and with fruit. And boy, that is not true in the Mediterranean. It is savory all the way. I mean, it's certainly used at times sweetened, but way more used as a savory dish. So it's just almost as a dip too, but to serve with this, the kofta, um, the cooked kofta beef bowl, bowl uh, the beef bulgur kofta is what we will have. So <laughs> we're all ready to serve when that comes out of the um, oven. And just like meatballs, they're fabulous to freeze, fabulous. Mm -hmm. They're gonna be so easy to freeze and just pop out as you need them or use them um, kind of thing. But then it's great, make a double batch and then you have them in the freezer for a couple weeks or so. Great thing too, if you have that ground beef in the fridge, you haven't used it, let's reduce the food waste too. So a quick thing about that, you're hearing the word sustainability a lot. Um, me and Serena wrote a whole cookbook about it, but it's about like being conscious about when we are buying food, when we are cooking food, when we are storing food, when we are um, like putting, yeah, storing food, whether when we bring it home from the store or after we eat it with leftovers, 
over 30% of the food in this country we buy is thrown out. I mean, that is a staggering number. Um, and we all contribute to it, not willingly, of course. We do not, you know, we don't go to the store and be like, oh, we're going to buy all this food and throw, half, throw one third of it half. It just happens often when you're buying especially fresh produce or herbs or food and maybe use half of it and the other half goes into the fridge to die. That's what I say. All my herbs were always like that too. Um, so there's so many different little things you can start doing to kind of be aware of that too. So go look in your fridge. What do you have in your fridge? Do you have that extra leftover grain to use in a dish like this? Or um, with the next dish we're gonna do, the vegetables that we're using, we're using zucchini, but do you have something else in your fruit fridge that you can use up? Rely on frozen food, foods and canned foods too, especially vegetables, um, fruits that might not be in season, fresh. I mean, frozen and canned are fabulous too because they're obviously much longer lasting than your mm -hmm. fresh produce. They can be more affordable too. So right now, I really like to talk about the Mediterranean diet, taking away that myth that it's expensive. It can be affordable, it's successful, it's easy. Um, it doesn't always have to be the fresh fruits and vegetables. And sometimes they get a health halo that they are superior and I'll tell you right now, it's not true, okay? Mm -hmm. There's certainly even like benefits to having like canned tomatoes because they're cooked and the lyocin is comes out of more than a fresh tomato kind of thing. Um, so there's room for all of those um, things in there. And then real quick about beef, I mean, cattle are like amazing, amazing. We like to call them upcyclers because often you hear just about practices um, it, with the environment and what's good and not and just, they are incredible because what they actually do is they eat things that we can't eat as humans. So grass, they eat, uh, the majority of their diet is unedible to us and they'll eat leftover waste like byproducts from beer. Um, it's funny how many farms I've gone to where um, farmers get the leftover um, mash from when they make beer and they feed it to the livestock. Otherwise that stuff goes in a landfill. So mm -hmm. cattle take it, they eat it, and then they produce this uh, amazing um, high protein food for us. Um, so in a way they're kind of recycling stuff that would just go in a landfill too. Um, so that's kind of a cool thing to think about too. And also cattle, they graze on areas where you can't grow crops um, to feed the world basically. Lots of times they eat, they're eating grass in areas where it's, the soil is too sandy to grow crops or too rocky or too steep and cows get in there and eat the grass that's there. And again, it's a better use of the land because you can't use it to grow um, crops too. So there's many other fun examples too, but that's something to kind of think about too when you're hearing more about the word sustainable, environmental friendly, because that is something that's not going away as climate change continues to be talked about more and more and ways you can when you're making food choices to um, keep in mind where your food's coming from but also what you're doing at home to help with that okay mm -hmm. so there's my little sustainability lecture but I'll have some more like uh, reducing food waste ideas too as we cook this next recipe here and our next recipe um, is actually from the beef uh it's wait is the website beef it's what's for dinner or beef it is yeah so you can also yeah. find the i'll drop the link in there too but yeah. you can find it at beef it's what's for dinner at pbeef.org or um northeastbeef.org a lot of them all kind of connect together right um right. so yeah really easy peasy <laughs> i just wanted to make sure i was saying yeah i thought it was the whole phrase it's for dinner right okay excellent all right so this is a ground beef pasta skillet primavera so um, I actually took this recipe and I made a little couple of adaptations to it and I wanna share some even more adaptations to it. So again, you can use what you have on hand and you can make it so it's what your family would like and what you would like. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is, oh, that's hot just from my oven being on. All right, <clears throat> so what we're gonna do first is cook up our ground beef. So let me get that out of the refrigerator. Okay, so when you hear the word primavera, it's an Italian word for spring. Okay, so maybe I thought we picked this recipe, Beth, because we're dreaming of spring right now. <laughs> yes, so I we know that I am. <laughs> about spring that's to come. And often you hear that it was like embedded by some restaurant or some chef at some point. And 
often when you see that on the menu, it's including some type of like fresh vegetable, often like peas or carrots, or in this case, we're talking zucchini, white squash, which actually really isn't in season right now, but we're being hopeful for the future. Mm -hmm. But I want you to think of this recipe where those are the, like the fresh veggies we're using it. You can use frozen versions of that. You can use frozen versions like a broccoli or canned versions of different things, even mushrooms in this, whatever you have in hand. Next time you make this, go look. Don't go to the store and buy the zucchini if it's not in season. Go look in your refrigerator. What veggies do I have in there that I need to cook up before they wilt and I'm going to toss them? Um, or do I have something frozen in uh, my freezer that could substitute in? Or even um, a canned good like the roasted red peppers. I mean, we are going to use some canned tomatoes in this and um, an addition I'm going to make too that's canned good too. So it's just a way of kind of thinking of taking a basic recipe and using what you have on hand. But in this case, I do wanna show it with you with the zucchini and squash. And maybe you can remember that for when you have so much zucchini, it's coming out of your ears because there's that time of year too, right? That's right. <laughs> all right, that's so right. we are going to, in a large skillet, believe it or not, this all fits in the skillet. I was very skeptical the first time I made this and it worked. So you could use um, a large, this is, a, uh, this is actually not a skillet. This is um, a big pan with a side here, or you could use a skillet large, or you could actually use a large pot too, like a Dutch oven if you really wanted to. If you didn't think, if you didn't have a lid to fit your skillet, you could use any of those things. Okay, so my cat's here crying already for food. So he's really gonna go nuts when he starts smelling this. <laughs> so um, you could just put the beef in right like this. I had to, I, it's just out of habit. I love to add a touch of olive oil. This recipe is approved or certified by the American Heart Association. So they are pretty stringent about the fat contents, the sodium contents, but like just adding a couple little things like I'm doing, it's still going to be a heart healthy dish. So, but if you follow it to a T, that follows the American heart standards um, for this dish. So I add a little oil. I just want it to heat up over medium heat. We are going to cook. Um, this is 96% uh, lean ground beef. Um, but again, if you can't find that and you want to do, if you, or you, um, want to use like a 92%, a 90%, 93, that's all lean options, not anything 90% and over. Um, but I, this is a 96% lean, uh, ground beef here. So we're going to cook that up and we're going to cook that for about eight minutes. Oh my gosh. And I got this handy tool from, uh, and I didn't even, I did, thank you for sending me all my, like my apron. And I have this handy tool, which is so cool. Is it called something special, Beth? Or it's just like I, beef mash or yeah, stir or skillet? I, I think it's called like a mix and chop or something like that. But I swear it is life, uh, life changing when it comes to cooking ground, uh, ground beef. So I'm oh my gosh, I'm putting that in the, those prizes that, you know, the lucky winners so far, you will be getting one of those mix and chop so tools that Deanna has there. Probably hold, yeah. So if you're getting the swag, I'm like, this is genius because we're going to break up the beef. And then we're going to switch. Oh, makes the cook faster, faster. Yep. <laughs> oh my gosh. I was like, this is genius. All right. So we're putting that right in here. Oh yeah. The cat's going crazy back here at my feet. Oh my gosh. Look at this. Ah, this is so cool. I'm so excited. <laughs> oh my gosh. This is fabulous. So look, so this is, if you don't have this fabulous tool, you can certainly use a little spoon, a spatula, um, to just break up into crumbles. So we're going to break it up a little bit, let it cook, break it up a little bit. And we want to do this for about eight to 10 minutes. But here's the thing, we're going to cook this, but it's actually okay if it's not completely cooked through because then we're going to put um, some veggies, some liquid in here and pasta and then cook the whole thing another 10 minutes or so. So it will be absolutely thoroughly cooked by then. Okay, so this is dead. I love this. All right, let's see how much time we have left on your. Okay, so Beth, can you time me for um, just about eight minutes for my beef here? Yep, you got Final. it. Eight minutes. Yeah, thanks. All right, cool. So as that's cooking, we are going to talk about the other things we are going to put into this. Actually, what I'm going to do is first switch to the very last ingredient we're going to put in because we'll get it ready. So. What I added to this recipe was canned beans. Now, again, beef, mixing beef with beans is fabulous. Well, it's very traditional. Think of chili. Think of a lot of dishes, um, even in our country where we do that. Um, but it's such a great combination of, you know, 
plant and like some greens are can, uh, you know, considered a protein food, but also that vegetable too. So it's another way to get a vegetable in. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, I forgot to talk about with our coffee because when I take it out, I'll tell you about um, the fruits combination. Anyway, um, but it's another way to get some of those nutrients that complement the, the ground beef. And it's just another way to get a little more fiber in your family's diet. And I'm going to show you it's in a way that's like, you will not even know. And I'm not a big person to be like, ooh, sneak all these foods into dishes, but you're just kind of mixing it in. We're going to mash it up. And the way you mix it in at the very end, it is all mixed in. I do this all the time when I do ground beef, making it for tacos. Um, I will do this trick with uh, a can of beans and mix it into the final with the sauce and everything and the, the ground beef. And it's just, I normally use, um, which what I'm going to do right now is um, cannellini beans, which are like white beans, but you can really do this with any kind of bean, but they tend to be the most mild and smooth mm -hmm. and smoothest bean um, to do this trick with, but you can mm -hmm. really use this with kind of any bean in your pantry. Okay, so these are canned beans and canned beans absolutely have sodium in them. Some people cook dry from dry beans, which is fabulous. Um, I don't bother with that, but if you have time to do that, that's great. Um, and it's super, super, duper inexpensive. Like a can of uh, like a bag of dried beans, it's often like under a dollar. But even canned beans are very reasonable as well. So I pretty much always have every kind of canned bean in my pantry. And um, cannellini beans are my favorite. In fact, um, this conference I was at. Uh, over the weekend from, um, it was a guy from canbeans.org and he told me, depending on where you live in the country, what the most popular beans are that are sold. And where I am in the Northeast, I'm in Philadelphia, by the way, um, cannellini beans are top. And if you think about it, as you go further South, especially like the Texas border, all that pinto beans, um, more down South black beans, um, they all kind of pop up too, but I just thought it was super interesting depending where you live. Um, what's the most popular type of bean that's being sold. Okay. So going back Dan, to our, real, quick, yeah. real quick thing, Dan, my timer just went off for the koftas. Do, are yours good or is oh, anyone's yeah, cooking along? Right perfect. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, perfect. And Erica shared a little tip here. She said that she always um, also adds lentils to ground beef, like in her sliders, meatballs, meatloaf, burgers, and her husband and kiddos haven't figured it out. So that's I a win right there, Mama. Who was that who said that? That was uh, Erica. She was one of our prizes. She's uh, our lovely, uh, yeah, the person on camera here with us. <laughs> and lentils are I, great. Uh, yes, I love it. And lentils are fabulous because they kind of just, again, kind of have that umami flavor too. Yeah. They are really good. So lentils are another fabulous one to use that for. Okay, so let's check. I love it. See, you always learn from everyone else. All right, where's my timer? Here's my timer. All right, let me check my cloth this here. So what I'm going to do, let's see here. Can you see? Oh my gosh, I smell the cinnamon. It smells so good. It smells so good. Okay, we're going to put this. I'm going to choose one in the middle and check the inner temperature here. And we are at, oh, we are good. We're at 70s. So I'm taking these puppies out. All right. Okay, okay. I'm just going to cool them over here, but actually, let me show you guys. Goodness, they look so yummy. Okay, this is what they look like. They smell so good. Okay, so my fun little tip with your koftas, if you want to make them even more <clears throat> traditional, is you can take um, about one fourth cup of diced prunes. Um, so that's six or seven prunes. Shop them up and mix them into that mix before you bake them. And that gives extra moisture, a little hit of sweetness. And that is, again, very traditional. Often um, in North African countries, <clears throat> they will, if you've heard of tangines, like they will put, if they're making beef or chicken, they will add dried apricots, dried plums, or well, prunes, which are prunes, dried cherries, raisins, all of that. So it adds extra fiber, other nutrients, this other layer of amazing sweetness and tons of moisture. Because we always know we want our meatballs or our meatloaf to be moist, right? So that's another fun thing. If you have something like that in your pantry, um, any kind of dried fruit, add just, it's just a quarter cup, chop it up and mix it in with your koftas and let me know what you think. So that's how beef can pair with fruit too. I mean, it's, it's very traditional in other countries, whereas we might have not always thought of that. So I love that tip. Okay, so back to my ground beef, which is probably gonna be getting done in a couple minutes. But let me show you yeah. our bean trick. 
and of course, yeah, we've got about two and a half minutes there on the ground beef. Perfect. Or you could do this with lentils too. Okay, so as you can see, I'm straining my beans. Okay, so you can reduce up to 40% of the sodium in canned beans by draining it and rinsing it. Now, I love bean juice. There is some sodium in here. This is called aquafaba too. If you ever heard that fancy term, it's basically bean juice. It has amazing flavor in it. It does have some of the sodium in it. So I save this um, before I'm done my final dish because if I need to add a little more liquid or moisture in, much like if you make pasta and you drain it, save that pasta water. It has starch in it. It's like liquid gold. Same with the beans here. I'm going to add a little bit back in if I need it, but I am going to go rinse these beans right now just to get rid of some of the sodium. Um, so let me just go to the sink real quick. Okay. You can also, now these are just regular. I tend to buy regular beans. I don't bother buying the lower sodium stuff. You certainly can do that. But if you're gonna do that, um, you, and you're, you're really not, you have to, you're gonna have to add a little salt to your recipe. I'm not adding any salt to this recipe, which is very rare for me, but that's because I'm going to use some of this bean liquid that has some sodium in it, okay? And then our beef broth is reduced sodium. It's not no salt, so that's gonna have some sodium um, in it as well, for so salt for flavor. Okay, mm -hmm. so take your beans, get a potato masher. You can use a fork too. And this is fun for the kids. Well, Erica, I don't know if you, you would do this because you still, your kids don't know about the, uh, the lentils being added in. So keep that, keep that myth going as long as possible. But if you have your kids cooking along, this is a fun thing for them to do. But what we do is just literally mash this down into a paste. So when this dish is completely done, it is all gonna kind of like melt together. It's amazing how it just really kind of all comes together. It's really creamy and you cannot even tell. Now, if you don't mind, if your family likes beans or you like beans whole, you don't even have to bother with this. You can just dump this in at the end, just the can of beans um, whole. And you could do this with kidney beans. Um, you could, pinto beans are nice and creamy as well. Black beans are gonna add a little more flavor, a little more punch and like um, dark kidney, yeah, kidney beans will probably as well. But the more mild are obviously like your white beans like this and um, pinto. Chickpeas have a little different flavor, you know, like what's in hummus, but if your family likes them, that can be something else. Now with chickpeas, you're going to have a little bit of the fibrous skin. Um, it will mix in, but you might see some of that as well, just FYI. Um, it doesn't bother me, but that's just something to think about. Okay, so we're going to put this aside for the very end, but I just wanted to do Yep, that. and Deanna, you're, you're at time there for the ground beef. Sorry to interrupt you, but you're at time. <laughs> Perfect, because we're ready for putting everything else in. That yeah, and actually we have a comment here again from um, Denise Share that this would probably be a good soup thickener too to use the mashed beans to thicken a soup. So that's a really great suggestion. Oh my gosh, See, Denise, I've been doing these cooking classes for years. I've never heard that suggestion and it is a fabulous one. Absolutely. Because sometimes if you're making a soup, you might just be, and that's a great I, That's a great way to use up stuff you have in, in, your, in your pantry, in your kitchen, all mm -hmm. that. And it might be, feel too thin mash up some beans and put it in. It's also a way you could like puree the soup a little bit, some of the broth with the beans too. I actually do that when I make a pasta fazool sometimes. Um, instead of just having all the beans in whole, I'll mash up some and then take some of the broth and puree it with the beans. So that is, uh, I love it, love it, love it. I'm going to use that tip now when I mash yes. the beans. So <laughs> thank you. Was that Denise, I think, who gave that tip? Yeah, Denise Sadler. Yes, I love it you too. That's a, awesome. You're speaking a dietitian's language. <laughs> I love it. You guys have, I'm telling you, I, every time I do this class, I learn another tip to share. So thank you for that. All right, so this is perfect timing because our ground beef's ready. And now we're going to put everything in. And this is one of those one pot meals, which is so fantastic too. You're even cooking the pasta in here. And the Italian in me was very skeptical when I saw this recipe and I'm like, there's not a lot of liquid to cook the pasta. It works. And I'm going to tell you why it works. Okay. That's like, uh-huh. Cause she's made yeah. this. This is why I chose the recipes for the primavera <laughs> side. It's like the ease, the fact that you don't need an extra strainer and like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And like I said, made the skeptical Italian, like, oh, you can't cook pasta this way. Okay. So what we're going to do, this is, I already measured it out. It's one can, uh, like, so your 14 and a half ounce can of reduced sodium beef broth. Um, we're gonna pour that in. <clears throat> and then we are going, I'm gonna put the pasta in last. 
I've already cut up my zucchini and squash. So this was like two, I did one zucchini, one squash. And again, um, you could do frozen for this um, as well. Now, if you were doing frozen veggies in this, I would actually let them thaw um, out because that's gonna slow down the cooking time of all of this if you put them in frozen. So what I would like zap them in the microwave and thaw them out a little bit um, and then drain them and then save the water if you need a little extra liquid. But this is the fresh stuff going right in. And I'd say this is about like a cup and a half of, of veggies, chopped veggies, I'd say. If you had leftover tomatoes, like cherry tomatoes or anything, you could put them in here um, as well. Peppers, broccoli, I mean, peas, uh, green, chopped up green beans would work too, uh, mushrooms. Okay, so we have our pasta in there. And then we're gonna put in a can of tomatoes. Let me tell you, Mediterranean cooking, canned tomatoes, staple, staple in the pantry. Um, diced tomatoes, whole tomatoes, because think about tomato season, it's very rare when tomatoes taste really, really good. The only tomatoes really I buy all year round is from the grocery store, the great ones, because they fresh ones tend to taste okay. But as far as like a whole big tomato, um, unless it's summertime or the pea, I live near New Jersey, I get amazing tomatoes or for someone's garden, I'm using canned tomatoes. And um, they are a huge, fabulous staple, as you probably all know, for so many recipes, um, Mediterranean and beyond. So we're using, and this is a no salt version. The other fun thing with this is um, to add a little flavor, more flavor. You could use um, diced fire roasted tomatoes if you've ever seen those. Remember heat adds flavor and that's just, it's the way they're roasted, they add a little more smoky kick to them. Or sometimes you see the diced tomato with chilies. Um, you could use those as well for sure. You're just getting um, a little more flavor in that way. But these are pretty flavorful too. Okay, so one can of that and the moisture from this is good with the beef is gonna help cook the pasta and everything as well. And then we're gonna put our Italian seasoning in. So this is about one fourth teaspoon of Italian seasoning. I don't have that on hand. So I did a combination of thyme and oregano. You could do thyme, oregano, and rosemary. You could just do oregano. You could just do thyme, a combination of any of those. And what I like to do when I have dried um, Italian seasoning, oregano, thyme, rosemary, is take it and crush it between your fingers. When you put it in, it just gives, um, kind of releases some of the um, essence and oils that are in that dried. You can smell it when you do that too. And it just kind of gives it a kickstart to cooking. One more thing, if you're like me and will buy dry or buy herbs because you can't grow them. I'm a total black thumb and I admit it. So I buy my herbs or people give them to me in the summertime. I will never use up all those fresh herbs in the amount of time. Although I would encourage you, that's another thing Mediterranean, don't put teaspoons, put cupfuls in things you make. When you make salads, don't put a couple teaspoons, chop the whole thing up, put a whole cup in, put a whole cup into, you could put it into this. Like it over there in Mediterranean, special meal East, if you get tabbouleh, it's like a little bit of bulgur and all parsley. So mm -hmm. um, fresh herbs like parsley, rosemary, um, basil, mint, you can use them interchangeably. Think of them as salad leaves. But if you're not using all of them, um, in this case, thyme, often I'll buy thyme in the grocery store and I'll just leave it out on the counter. I don't even bother putting it by spring and see it gets dried like this. And then I will literally take this and I have a container here. Save your old spice containers. Once you get through a spice, save it. This is an old um, one. This is actually, I think, an old honey container. And I literally just take the, um, so the, the, st the stem is woody and dried out. It's the leaves that are already dried. You can't uh, eat the stem and you just kind of crush your fingers in this and you can have your own dried thyme like this, okay? So this is all, the whole entire thing that would have got thrown away, but I just let it dry on my um, kitchen counter. I find I can do it best with rosemary and thyme this way, um, but that's just one other way um, to kind of save on food waste. You could also throw them, chop up all your herbs. When you get home, you can use half of them, put the rest in, um, ice cube trays and put some oil in the olive oil in them and freeze them. And they're like little flavor bombs. Just put it in like a Ziploc bag in the refrigerator. And then when you're making something like this or a soup or you're sauteing veggies, you throw it in the pot and you got like a little flavor bomb there. Okay, so we got our fresh herbs in and I gotta get this going. So we get this done before we're, we're, um, we're done for time. And then I'm adding eight ounces. This is fusilli or rotini. So our little corkscrews, you can use um, penne for this. 
Um, you can use shells for this. Basically, you could use any kind of short um, pasta shape. You just don't want to use spaghetti for this. It, it would kind of be a little more unwieldy. So I'm just going to mix it up a little bit. But um, right, like I said, when I first did this, I was like, eh, I'm skeptical because the pasta is not covered. But what you're going to do is bring this to a boil. And then once it comes to a boil, we're gonna put a lid on it and it's gonna cook down. And what happens is when we put a lid on it is the steam really cooks everything together. I'm actually gonna put on a lid ahead of time too, but I just gotta keep an eye on it because that's gonna make it come to a boil quicker. But once it comes to a boil, we wanna turn it down to medium. And then it's like nine to 11 minutes. I'm gonna check it a little sooner because this pasta cooks up a little faster. Depending on your pasta, if you use a smaller pasta, some pastas cook quicker than like a penne. Um, so I'm gonna check it in about eight minutes after it comes to a boil but it's amazing, mm -hmm. it will be done. And this is enough liquid to cook it all. So like I said, the first time I did, I did penne, which was bigger and I was skeptical and it totally worked. Now I used whole wheat pasta here. You can certainly use regular pasta. You could do a combination of both. Um, I know a lot of times it's like, oh, you should use whole wheat instead of regular. Regular pasta, just as good for you, it is fine. I'm a diehard Italian person. I pretty much like my regular. I'll mix it with whole wheat sometimes. <laughs> Or you can use, they have the, those chickpea pasta base. Any kind you want is gonna be fine, but don't feel like you can't use just regular good old um, uh, pasta um, made just, you know, the traditional way, the way my grandmother used it kind of thing. All right. <laughs> as soon as it gets going, I will um, we'll, uh, make sure that cooks. Let's see, what are we on time here, Beth? Okay, we're we're about, five, we have about five, five minutes. minutes. Yeah, it might not be ready in five minutes, but we'll talk about it. But let me show you, let's do our, show you how our coftas would look here. Do you want to do your, um, I don't know, did anyone make the coftas and want to show us? Yeah, we'd love a little show and tell. And again, that might earn you one of our awesome prize packs and a, uh, actually, this is the two cookbook giveaway, right, Deanna? Yeah. You know us, if you've made the coftas, or let's even say you, you have your primavera starting to cook in the skillet. Do you want to, does anyone want to show off what they've done? No one's brave. <laughs> no one's brave. Aww. Or I don't not. think anyone's quite, I think everyone's just chilling and you know we'll uh, prepare the recipes another time I guess. <laughs> well how about this is anyone going to if they want to mention how they might um which one of the recipes they want to try first and if there's any like tweak they're going to do to it oh someone said something. Oh, Denise. Oh, well, Denise, yeah, I feel like you've earned yourself a prize with that awesome tip. So Denise says she's uh watching us. Um Denise what are you which recipe will you try first do you think? Both, I do have to say, I've been cooking along. Both of them smell amazing. I can't <laughs> dinner well, and Denise, leftovers. Yeah. Denise gave that tip, right? So Correct, she, yeah. yeah. You want to give her the prize? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And koftas, okay. it's, yeah, K-O-F-T-A-S. I hope I spelled that correctly. So that's what she's, she's going to try that one first. Uh, awesome. At the end of the and maybe you can let us and know. And straight from Deanna's cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, and that's right. You're going to get, you're going to get the recipe in the cookbook too. Well, you guys have the recipe, but you're going to get the picture too. So this is how I'd serve this just like this. I can't wait to eat this for dinner right now. Um, but again, whatever you don't um, eat tonight, if you're not going to eat the next couple of days, you could absolutely freeze these. Um, you could just even crumble these up and um, put it into a soup if you wanted to at some point too, or toss with pasta. Okay. So mine, this is coming to a boil. So let me just show you right now. Okay, literally, this is what it looks like. And I'm going to put the lemon in it. It's going to cook. Okay, so we obviously, I did not time this right. This will, this will be ready in about, um, let's see, why is that turning off? Okay, there we go. Uh, about, eh, depending on the pasta, like about eight minutes because this pasta cooks a lot faster. And then let me just show you what you would do. Once it is all done, you would literally just mix this in. And I'm telling you, it's gonna just put it right into the pot and mix it into the sauce. And it's just going to kind of disappear. If you want a little more liquid, um, remember we have saved our aquafaba or bean liquid. You could put a little of that in, or you could put a little more beef broth in. You could put a little more water in. That would be fine too, because you just only need a couple tablespoons and it's still gonna be super flavorful. And because if you're using this aquafaba, um, and the seasoning, I found it actually tasted like it had enough salt in it because there was sodium in those things too. So, um, 
like I said, it's pretty amazing how quickly it come it comes together. And even like with the dried pasta sticking on top. Now I don't know about you, Beth, but about halfway through I did stir it. So about yeah. halfway through I stirred it just to make sure the pasta that was sitting on the top kind of went down underneath the liquid. Yep. So stirring yeah, so it a couple times dry. is not a bad idea, but just make sure that lid is on there. And if you don't have a lid to cover your skillet, you can do it in a different type of pot as well. In fact, the first time I did this, I did it with a skillet and um, this lid didn't cover it all the way and it still cooked perfectly. So um, we were good with that. So yeah. So we'll just yeah. uh, a little. Well, we have a couple quick comments too in here that I just want to address. Um, so Erica says she's going to try adding uh, dry diced apricots to the coffees, which sounds really awesome. And Jody yes. is saying she might be trying that one as well. Um, and then Jody, who was actually one of our PA beef producers. So we're so fortunate that Jody has joined us. Welcome, um, thank Jody. you so much, Jody. So she, she joined a little bit late, she says, but she's also planning to make the koftas. Um, she's trying to work on getting the picky Dutch eaters in her family to try some more beans and, you know, expand their palates a little bit more. <laughs> yes. And oh, Jody, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's the whole purpose about the Mediterranean diet recipes that we use. We have something for everyone. We have it, you know, it's if you are a vegetarian, we have recipes in there, but if you're your meat and potato kind of people that we get it, like this kind of seems really exotic. This is the way you can turn it in, put, put those beans in mixed in, make the koftas and say, we're having meatballs tonight <laughs> and don't tell them there's cinnamon in there and see what they think. I mean, maybe even serve them like you would regular meatballs. You know, you don't have to do, even if pita seems a little too exotic, serve them how you would serve regular meatballs and see what people think, you know? So um, it's all in the presentation, um, but we love taking, just finding where people are, where their tastes are and not being like, okay, you got to change your palate and your diet completely. Okay, you're the Dutch meat and potato kind of thing. So let's take what you like and let's expand it a little bit with a couple different spices maybe, or maybe just another um, vegetable that you like, but pair it a different way kind of thing. So I mm -hmm. love that you brought that up, but if you do make them, let me know what your family thinks because we love to hear. And uh, thank you, Jody, on behalf of uh, Pennsylvania Beef Council and the um, Northeast Beef, Beef Initiative for helping sponsor tonight. So I really am grateful to you guys for that as well. Oh, there she is. Yeah. Oh, and potato yeah, she's rolls. Oh, exactly. on potato rolls. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. See, it's all about fusion cuisine, right? <laughs> That's right. That's, That's awesome. right. And then um, the next well, again, step could be the yogurt sauce, Jody, at some point, you know? That's I right, yeah, little, little you know steps. I love <laughs> hot sauce, and I'm going to mix some hot sauce in there. I'm like, hey, whatever, you know, you can put sriracha in it. Like, whatever kind of takes you to the next step with trying things. So I love the koftas and the potato rolls. I think that's great. And I want to try the dried apricots and the koftas. I just sound, I have dried up, dry apricots. I think next time I make them, I'm going to do that. So, um, yes, yeah, so I'm good. sorry that this dish wasn't finalized, but really the only thing we do is mix in the beans at this point. And uh, like I said, you'll be amazed how that pasta, I'll, I'll just stop opening the pot yet now because the steam keeps coming up, how that will be ready to go. Um, yeah, so I think that's everything on my end. If you want to um, uh, follow, I have a newsletter that comes out every week that mm -hmm. shares our recipes. My business partner and I do Facebook lives, like little mini cooking demos like this every Thursday. They're about a half hour. Um, every Thursday, a teaspoon of spice on Facebook, but they're recorded. So if you're not there live, there are posts then, so you can watch them then if you want to. But we also have, if you go to teaspoonofspice.com at the top, you can sign up to get our newsletter. It goes out once a week on a Sunday and we just kind of recap what recipes we've talked about on our blog that week. And that's how you'd find out about a class like this. So if I was doing something like that, and then we also um, provide links to those Facebook lives, just kind of a way to keep you in the loop. Um, and also we have exclusives for our subscribers, especially when our cookbook will be coming out later this year. Um, but you're welcome to contact me through there at any time with anything. Please let me know if you make one of these because um, we always love to hear feedback, even if something doesn't go right or your family didn't like this. We It all helps in the long run when we're developing recipes. Oh, Janet, thank you. Glad to hear that. Thanks for spending Absolutely. your time with us. Yeah, excellent. And if you, um, you want to join us again, we are having another class this Tuesday, the 25th. Um, that will be at 6 p.m. So if you didn't want to click along this time, you do have the, the other chance to, to cook along with us on Tuesday. 
Or if you know someone that might want to participate with us, you know, spread the word. Hopefully you enjoyed the information and the class and the recipes, um, you know, share the suggestion with a friend, um, you know, and hopefully they'll join us on Tuesday. Um, but yeah, I just want to thank Deanna again. You've been amazing to work with. This was so much fun. You know, I've definitely learned a number of like tricks and tips for the kitchen. So I'm so grateful for that. Um, and just again, you know, addressing our sponsor, the PA Beef Council, Northeast Beef Promotion Initiative, working really hard on behalf of beef, beef farmers and ranchers to share programming like this, um, you know, with our checkoff dollars. And, you know, we, we love being able to share messaging and, and recipes and all the different inspiration that we shared here this evening. So uh, visit us at pabeef.org, northeastbeef.org. You have our recipe link there. Um, you can always email me to the dietitian with the Beef Council at bstark at pabeef.org. Um, but I think we're wrapped up for this evening. Thank you all again. and Have a wonderful week. Thanks for joining. Oh, yay, Kara's making it for dinner. I love it. Perfect. Yeah, so if you join Tuesday, it's the same recipes, but you can cook along this time or let someone know. And thank you for everyone who registered because your donation will go to Phil Abundance, which absolutely, um, which is uh, helps uh, the food insecure in the Philadelphia area. So thank you so much. Very good. Bye.